Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, I try to keep an open mind to everything that I read from the 19th century and the Civil War era in particular. There is one genre of writing that I find particularly challenging, and that's humor. It just doesn't hold up that well, I've found. And it's tedious, probably because it's so topical. And at the time, it was crazy funny and people were laughing, getting chuckles, reading humor in books and magazines and newspapers. But because it's so topical, it just doesn't stand the test of time. And this is where today's individual comes into play. He was one of those forgotten humorists. His name is Mortimer Neal Thompson, and he enjoyed national stardom before the war as a crazy funny humorist, cranking out a slew of books between 1854 and 1860. But people didn't know him by his real name. They knew him by his pseudonym, QK Philander Dostics. That cracked people up right there. Now, like many comic geniuses, his fall from grace was fast and he was soon forgotten. The public adoration he enjoyed just dropped off quickly. And again, not unusual. America went through comics and funny men and funny ladies as fast as anything you can imagine. In fact, as one writer put it, quote, there is nothing in which the public is more capricious than in its love of fun. The favorite jester of today is the tedious fool of next week. And so it was with Thompson, or Doe Sticks, as he was affectionately known, at least for a while. He was swept into the dustbin of 19th century comics and humorists. Of course, there is the one exception, Mark Twain. Now, though Doe Stick's witty observations of life and characters twisting into belly laughs and convulsions earned him a spot, at least on the list of the century's forgotten funny men, he is remembered today for a single piece of work, and it's quite the opposite of what he was celebrated for in the 1850s. It's a serious piece of journalism. He wrote it when he was a correspondent for the New York Tribune in 1859. His reporting, a particular report on an auction of enslaved men, women, and children, captured the brutality, the inhumanity, and the cold economics of the peculiar institution and the white people who participated in it. The power and poignancy of Thompson's words, dough sticks, right, captured the attention of leaders of the American Anti-Slavery Society who republished it in a pamphlet form titled, quote, the Great Auction Sale of Slaves at Savannah, Georgia, March 2nd and 3rd, 1859. It's a particularly difficult piece to read through. I want to share you some of the passages of it just to give you a sense of Dostick's abilities as a writer and how he captured the human condition, not only of the enslaved men, women, children, families that were on the auction block, but also of the men who were there to do the bidding. So let me start with the very beginning of the story, just to give you an introduction in Dostick's own words. He says, quote, the largest sale of human chattels that has been made in star-spangled America for several years took place on Wednesday and Thursday, of last week at the race course near the city of Savannah, Georgia. The lot consisted of 436 men, women, children, and infants 
being that half of the Negro stock remaining on old Major Butler's plantations, which fell to one of two heirs to that estate. Major Butler dying left a property valued at more than a million of dollars, the major part of which was invested in rice and cotton plantations and the slaves thereon, all of which immense fortune descended to his heirs. His sons, Mr. John A. Butler, sometime deceased, and Mr. Pierce M. Butler, still living and a resident in the city of Philadelphia in the free state of Pennsylvania. Losses in the great crash of 1857 to 58 and other exigencies of business have compelled the latter gentleman to realize on his Southern investments that he may satisfy his pressing creditors. The sale had been advertised largely for many weeks, though the name of Mr. Butler was not mentioned, and as the Negroes were known to be a choice lot and very desirable property, the attendance of buyers was large. The breakup of an old family estate is so uncommon an occurrence that the affair was regarded with the sale. Every hotel in Savannah was crowded with speculators from North and South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, who had been attracted hither by the prospects of making good bargains. Nothing was heard for days in the bar rooms and public rooms but talk of the great sale, criticisms of the business affairs of Mr. Butler, and speculations as to the probable prices the stock would bring. So, that's a bit of a description of the lead up to the sale and the particulars of the sale itself and the family that was breaking up their plantations and 436 human beings. Now, the next passage is Doe Stick's description of the enslaved people while they were waiting for auction. It's subtitled, How They Were Treated in Savannah. These Negroes were brought to Savannah in small lots, as many at a time as could be conveniently taken care of, the last of them reaching the city the Friday before the sale. They were consigned to the care of Mr. J. Bryan, auctioneer and Negro broker, who was to feed and keep them in condition until disposed of. Immediately on their arrival, they were taken to the race course and there quartered in the sheds erected for the accommodation of the horses and carriages of gentlemen attending the races. Into these sheds they were huddled pell-mell without any more attention to their comfort than was necessary to prevent their becoming ill and unsaleable. Each, quote, family had one or more boxes or bundles in which were stowed such scanty articles of their clothing as were not brought into immediate requisition, and their tin dishes and gourds for their food and drink. In these sheds were the chattels huddled together on the floor, there being no sign of bench or table. They eat and slept on the bare boards, their food being rice and beans, with occasionally a bit of bacon and cornbread. Their huge bundles were scattered over the floor, and thereon the slaves sat or refined, reclined, when not restlessly moving about, or gathered into sorrowful groups discussing the chances of their future fate. On the faces of all was an expression of heavy grief. Some appeared to be resigned to the hard stroke of fortune that had torn them from their homes and were sadly trying to make the best of it. Some sat brooding moodily over their sorrows, their chins resting on their hands, their eyes staring vacantly, and their bodies rocking to and fro with a restless motion that was never stilled. Few wept. The place was too public and the drivers too near, though some occasionally turned aside to give way to a few quiet tears. Now, the last part that I want to read to you is a description by Stostix of the white men who were there for the sale. And here's their story. A quote. 
It seems as if every shade of character capable of being implicated in the sale of human flesh and blood was represented among the buyers. There was the Georgia fast young man with his pantaloons tucked into his boots, his velvet cap jauntily dragged over to one side, his cheek full of tobacco, which he bites from a large plug that resembles more than anything else an old bit of a rusty wagon tire, and who is altogether an animal of quite different breed from your New York fast man. His ready revolver or his convenient knife is ready for instant use in case of a heated argument. White neckcloth, gold spectacled and silver haired old men were there, resembling in appearance that noxious breed of sanctimonious deacons, as we have in the North, who are perpetually leaving documents at your door that you never read, and the business of whose mendicant life is to eternally solicit subscriptions for charitable organizations of which they are treasurers. These gentry, with quiet step and subdued voice, moved carefully about among the livestock, ignoring, as a general rule, the men, but tormenting the women with questions, which, when accidentally overheard by the disinterested spectator, bred in that spectator's mind an almost irresistible desire to knock somebody down. And then all imaginable varieties of rough, backwoods rowdies who began the day in a spirited manner, but who, as its hours progressed and their practice at the bar became more prolific in results, waxed louder and talkier and more violent, were present and added a characteristic feature to the assemblage. So that's QK Philander Dostrix, pictured here, in his piece of writing, his eyewitness accounts of an auction in Savannah, Georgia in 1859. This is the piece that stays with us today, capturing the brutality of slavery, the enslaved men, women, and children being offered up at an auction, captured through the eye of a comic genius who thrilled America with his belly wrenching gut laughs between 1854 and 1860. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.